Certain actors in financial markets have been able to operate in the confidence that they, and the system as a whole, will not be allowed to fail, and that in one way or another, the American population will absorb the losses. So what this is talking about is if a business looks like it's going to go under, then the American government will step in with taxpayer money and save that business. Now, there's a lot of things that are wrong with this. First off, in a free market, we have this idea of it's basically an economic Darwinism. The strongest will survive. And those that don't survive didn't survive for a reason. And what's going to happen is their resources are going to be reallocated to other firms who are better suited to handle those resources and to make a profit and survive in the long run. The other problem that you have with this is that you can have politicians who are picking winners and losers, uh, people who people or businesses that they prefer. And you can understand how that's slightly corrupt. That shouldn't be happening. Now, Alan Greenspan solidified a reputation for himself among investors as Mr. Bailout. Well, with his 1994 bailout of the Mexican peso, the special rate cuts meant to ease the distress of the long-term capital management hedge fund and the flooding of the banking system with fresh reserves in the wake of September 11th, among numerous other examples. This, says economist Anthony Miller, is the philosophy, if it can be called that, that guided the Greenspan Fed from its inception in 1987. Since Alan Greenspan took office, financial markets in the U.S. have operated under a quasi-official charter, which says that the central bank will protect its major actors from the risk of bankruptcy. Consequently, the reasoning emerged that when you succeed, you will earn high profits and market share, and if you should fail, the authorities will save you anyway. When monetary authorities repeatedly act to ward off economic downturns and continue to feed the markets with fresh liquidity, the belief in an eternal boom becomes more widespread each time, and economic activity becomes more intensive. So what there's what he's saying is that if if a business is going to go out of is going to go under, then the Fed is going to increase liquidity. Again, remember liquidity has to, refers to liquid assets, which is money. So it's going to put money out into the system in order to save some of these businesses that are looking like they're not going to survive. Now the other part of this is that if you have businesses that know that they can get a bailout at any time, then they may engage in riskier behavior. If you're the CEO of a company and you want to earn maximum profits and you know that high risk equals high reward, then you might just go out there and do some risky things knowing that your backstop is the government. With the continuation of such a boom, prudence diminishes and new types of entrepreneurs appear. Analysts have sometimes called this the Greenspan put. What the Financial Times describes is the view that when markets unravel, count on the Federal Reserve and its chairman Alan Greenspan eventually to come to the rescue. The Times reported in 2000, in the wake of the dot-com boom, an increasing concern that the Greenspan put was injecting into the economy a destructive tendency toward excessively risky investment supported by hopes that the Fed will help if things go bad. All the insane dot-com investment we've seen, all this destruction of capital, all the crazy excesses of the past few years wouldn't have happened without the easy credit accommodated by the Fed, added financial consultant Michael Belkin. Try letting a few major firms, yes, even in the financial sector, where we superstitiously believe no failures can be allowed, actually go bankrupt for a change. Make perfectly clear once and for all that there will be no bailouts, no looting of the public on behalf of any firm, period. That would do more to jolt the financial sector into being sensible and cautious instead of reckless and irresponsible than all the regulatory tinkering in the world. Congress, the Bush administration, and the Obama administration have been considering just about every policy under the sun, except allowing the market to set housing prices where they obviously belong. In November 2008, Fannie and Freddie announced that they would take emergency action to help distressed homeowners avoid foreclosure. Homeowners are eligible for the assistance, which involves reductions in principal owed, lower interest rates, 
and a longer payoff term if they are at least 90 days delinquent on their mortgage payments and have high debt-to-income ratios and their mortgages are owned or guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie. Now, this seems like a wonderful way of trying to keep people in their homes, of making sure that people aren't just being kicked out by these horrible banks, but this is where you get the law of unintended consequences. What is going to happen if you tell people that they can not pay on their mortgage? Well, they're not gonna do it. What happens if you tell people that if they have a high debt to income ratio and that means that they're gonna get better terms, um, they're gonna go out and they're gonna make sure that they have a higher debt to income ratio. So while these things sounded like they were wonderful and that they were inspired and looking to help people out, what it's really going to do is it's going to make the market even worse. It's gonna make the market even more dysfunctional than what it already was. They must also owe at least 90% of their home's value. So if you bought more house than you could afford, if you took out home equity loans to purchase consumption goods, and if you're missing your payments, you get special consideration. Now let me go back here to what a home equity loan is. Equity in a house is the difference between the house's value and what you owe on it. So if you buy a house for $100,000, or let's say that you owe $100,000 on a house, but that house is worth $150,000, then you have $50,000 in equity. But remember, because houses are illiquid, you can't get to that money. The only way you can get to it is to sell it. So that $50,000, that's, that's, that's fantasy that doesn't actually exist unless you sell your house. But what banks will do is knowing that the market will bear that particular price, they will allow you to take out a loan with against the equity of your house. And you're basically, again, putting your house up as collateral with this home equity loan. So if you have a fifty thousand, if you have fifty thousand dollars in equity in your home, you can go out and you can get a fifty thousand dollar home equity loan. What do a lot of people do with these? They use them to fix up their houses, to remodel, to renovate, to buy new refrigerators, new stoves, to make their kitchen look nicer. That's what a lot of these home equity loans are used for. Now they could be used for other things, but that's generally what people tend to take them out for. In fact, under the program, people who bought luxury cars with the proceeds from refinancing their homes get to keep those things and are not expected to sell them in order to pay their mortgages. If you behaved responsibly and bought a smaller house than you could afford on the other hand and didn't treat your house as a giant ATM, you get no special consideration. In fact, you indirectly subsidize the foolish and improvident. Under this program, Fannie and Freddie will reduce monthly mortgage payments to as low as 38% of household income. Any principal reductions will be payable as a lump sum at the end of the mortgage period or at the time the house is sold. Thus, the program is intended both to keep people from being foreclosed on and to keep them from selling their homes. It indirectly props up home prices by keeping such dwellings off the market. Now, here's the problem with that. You have people who bought houses that they could not afford. Getting them to stay in their houses is not necessarily the solution. Remember that I told you earlier, renting is not a horrible thing. You are not an evil person if you rent an apartment or if you rent a house. But that's kind of the way that we look at renters in our society nowadays. So what should have happened was the people who bought houses that they could not afford should have been forced to sell those homes and go and rent until they could afford to buy. Now, the reason why the government wouldn't allow this to happen is, it because, is because it would have drawn, dropped housing prices even further. And they didn't want the bottom falling out of the housing market. In light of this offer, why wouldn't people whose mortgage loans are backed by Fannie and Freddie just stop making their mortgage payments altogether? Confident that the result will be a friendly telephone call offering them lower rates in principal and lower monthly payments. If the home is occupied by a married couple, one of the two individuals could also stop working 
in order to lower household income so that the new mortgage payment calculated in terms of household income will be all the easier to make. They could also do this in order to satisfy the debt to income ratio requirements. Then the out of work spouse could return to work or a homeowner could take a minimum wage job or ask for a temporary pay cut at his current job in order to get a mortgage payment of 38% of his lower income. One's credit rating would suffer if he defaulted in order to get a lower rate, but that's a trade-off some homeowners are doubtless willing to make, especially since delinquency causes less damage to a credit report than foreclosure. In December, a proposal was discussed whereby the Treasury would take various measures to reduce mortgage rates to 4.5% in order to make housing more affordable. As usual, we are promised that artificially low interest rates will solve our problems and that the fact of scarcity can be wished away by government action. Of course, just letting home prices fall would make housing more affordable and would make it possible for people to purchase homes without getting themselves so deep into debt, but this option is never considered. The government is determined to press forward in its war on reality and against natural market valuations of homes. And as usual, more of what caused the problem in the first place has been put forth as the solution. Alan Greenspan lowered interest rates to 1% for a full year, thereby intensifying the housing bubble and the pain that its inevitable burst would cause. As of late 2008, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke was aiming to bring interest rates down to just about zero. We are in for more resource misallocation and a more intense bust in the future. Greenspan tried to inflate his way out of a recession in 2000 and 2001, and the result was the worst one we face now. By trying to hold off this one, the Fed promises us a future that is worse still. Economist Gerald O'Driscoll, a former senior Fed official, compares the Fed to an arsonist watching a fire he set, expressing amazement at how such an event could have happened. Bernanke can pretend the Fed had nothing to do with the crisis, and can even repeat the exact policies that brought us to where we are, since no one will call him on it. Most Americans, unfortunately, don't know the first thing about the Fed, the quacks who operate it, or the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And most of Bernanke's vocal critics, even the ones who are supposed to be the experts, condemn him only for not lowering interest rates fast enough. As we'll see in Chapter 4, this is the very worst policy to adopt, and as we'll see by the end of this book, policies that might keep recessions short and swift are inevitably passed over in favor of proposals that will make Americans poor and keep the hard times going. We are really in for it.